I was diagnosed with cancer uh, in December of uh, 2019. And uh, after the doctor came in, I was laying there. Amy was not in the room at that time. And, the, uh, you know, we found this tumor and uh, we're going to be dealing with that. And he walked out of the room and I, I was still a little bit and, and I knew Amy was be coming in in a moment. But, I, you know, instinctively, and I don't say this to sound spiritual because it was just it was just the grace of God. But I just laid my head back on that pillow and out loud just started praising the Lord. And thanking him for his goodness and his faithfulness to me and, and, and how blessed my life was and has been. And as I spoke and just out loud was praising God, I didn't know it, but behind me, there was a nurse standing there working on the monitors that had been attached to me. And she stood quietly and listened while I praised the Lord. Two minutes, Amy came in and uh, the nurse slipped on out. And as we were leaving the clinic, this nurse came and caught Amy and I by the hands and turned us around. And with tears running down her cheeks, she said, you guys are going to make it through this. I know you are. You see, praise has power. And particularly praise in the darkness, in the night. So when you're tempted to complain, remind yourself or have somebody in your family. It's probably good, not husbands and wives, but maybe it is. Shh, the prisoners are listening. And, and decide to praise God instead because he's in control. Now, we're going to go through, this is probably my favorite session that I do. And just because we're going to walk through Luke 18. And uh, we're going to look at, there are parables, there are stories, there are events, uh, all in the life of Jesus. And they all portray, in a sense, the, the title up there is prayer attitudes. An attitude that we approach God with, that we are to approach God with. And so what we're going to do, we're just going to go through section by section in this chapter. And the first one is persistence. Now look at verse 1 here in Luke chapter 18. He says, now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart or not faint. Now stop there for a moment. If you want to understand a parable properly, the key to understanding a parable is to read what preceded the parable. Because Jesus always taught parables in response to events. If you want to understand the parable of the prodigal son correctly, because it's probably one of the most mistaught parables in the Bible, go back and read the beginning of the chapter, what just a few verses that lead into his telling the parable. Because then it suddenly, the, the parable comes alive. You understand who represents who in the story. Well, this is one of those rare parables where Jesus tells us up front why he's telling it. That they ought always to pray and not faint or lose heart. And that word, by the way, there is it's not a physical word, it's it's an emotional one. To to become really the root of it is kind of the idea of being a coward, to lose heart. See, you're either praying or you're losing heart. And so he says, when you begin to pray, stick with it. Don't lose heart. Be, be persistent in your prayer. So then he tells this parable. He says in a, verse 2, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. And for a while he was unwilling, but afterwards he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, Yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. And, and I love it. The word bother there is a really strong word that means to, to slap or to strike. She was just wearing him out. And so uh, he says, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming to me, she'll wear me out. And, and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice to his, for, for his elect? And this is the key, those first blanks there, who cry to him day and night. And those are the first blanks. They cry to him day and night. Now, in many parables, the authority figure in the parable represents God. It's important to understand in this parable, the authority figure represents the opposite of God. Because what he says is, look, he said, I don't care, I don't fear God. In other words, I don't care about what's righteous and right. And I don't care about people. 
But because this woman's wearing me out, I'm going to give her what she wants. And the point is that God is the opposite of that. He cares about what is right, and He cares about you. So God wants you to come with Him to persist in prayer, and it says, will not God give or answer the prayer for His elect, His children, who cry day and night to Him? Listen, God will answer prayer when it does two things. Number one, when it brings Him the greatest glory, and number two, when it strengthens our faith to the greatest degree. So God doesn't always answer prayer immediately. He will often work a process because it's in the process that He prepares us for the answer. Because God in the process is sanctifying us. So we, we persist in our praying. You know, I, I, I've shared this before here, I believe, but um, I prayed. My grandmother and I were the only believers in, in my family for many years, and she prayed me through my rebellion. I'll, I'll probably share more about that. Uh, but it, it's fascinating. We prayed when I came to Christ. She and I prayed for the rest of our family and saw nothing for 20 years. And then in a five-year span, I saw 13 of my family members come to Christ. It was amazing. You know, we used to, to go to family gatherings, and I was the weirdo religious guy. Now suddenly I'm mainstream. I don't know how to act because <laughs> they've all gotten saved. In, in fact, let me tell you something. In fact, look at the next blanks. We'll talk about this. We do not weary God into responding because we are His elect, He desires to help us. You see, the purpose of persistence in other religions, we talked about that prayer wheel the other night that you just spin. The purpose of prayer often is to weary God, their God, into just giving them what they want. God wants to answer our prayers he, because He is glorified when He does. Now, let me tell you something that may surprise you. God may set you praying for things you won't even see in your lifetime. Do you know that? The founder of our ministry prayed his entire you know, Christian life for revival in America. He died at the age of 42. He never saw it. But I'll tell you just a simple truth that God gave me understanding of. When my grandmother, I mentioned she was a Christian, uh, and, and I don't know how you work this out theologically, but I felt called to ministry when I was five years old, and we weren't even in church. I told my mom when I was five I was either going to be a preacher or a garbage man. And uh, sometimes I wonder if I picked the right one. And, uh, but as I got into my teen years, the thought of preaching just terrified me. And this has never been a real comfort zone for me in front of people. And so the thought of being spending my life doing it just terrified me, so I, I just resisted God and ran from Him. But my grandmother knew I'd been called into ministry. And she prayed for me to surrender to that. And I can remember coming in from bars and sitting on the edge of my bed and being under such intense conviction that out loud, like I'm talking to you right now, I would say, God, no, I am not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I didn't know in the next room my grandmother was praying for me. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. She was availing all over me. She made my life miserable. And at that point that God broke into my life at the age of 19, and I got up from that encounter with God knowing I was going into ministry, first person I told was my grandmother, and I'll never forget, a smile came across her face, and she said, Mark, I've known it for years. I've just been waiting for you to surrender to it. Now, a number of years ago, my grandmother went home to be with the Lord, and she, I knew where she was, and I had all that joy mixed with the sorrow of the lost, uh, we don't grieve, Paul said, as people with no hope. I had that hope. But, but what kind of threw me was that I grieved, and then I grieved, and I grieved. And for months, I was grieving, and I just, I was like, Lord, why can't I shake this in a strange way? It's just so heavy on me. And every time I think about the loss, it just lays on me. And I know where she is, and she's, just, you know, this was her whole life's purpose to be there. And then one morning in prayer, this thought suddenly came to mind. I said, Lord, I've lost my intercessor. I've lost my prayer warrior. 
And that's why I was grieving because I felt like I'd, and in this thought, and it had to be God, I know it was God, because I'd never thought about this before, but suddenly this thought came to mind, prayers don't die when people do. Have you ever thought about that? When my grandmother died, her prayers didn't die with her. I believe her prayers are still being answered in my life. In fact, Oswald Chambers put it this way. He said, when we obey God, we may be answering a prayer that somebody prayed a hundred years ago. Isn't that an incredible thought? So God may set you praying for something you won't even see in your lifetime. Now, there's several reasons for that, but let me tell you a primary one. Because where your treasure is, what's going to be there, Jesus said? Your heart. So God will set you praying for things to keep your heart tied to heaven for the things of his heart. But we come to God in prayer with persistence. Well, let's keep moving here. Look at verse 9. And he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, just, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Verse 13, the tax collector stand, but the tax collector standing at a distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. And this is the key here. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. So the second quality or attitude we come to God with is humility. And that is a key one because Scripture tells us that God does what to the proud? He resists them. Literally, it means He holds them at arm's length. So we come to God in humility. Now, notice the physical postures. The Pharisee stood and looked down on others. And you can see the posture there. He was an arrogant man, and as the crowd had gone in to the temple to pray, I'm sure he was at the very front, and he was standing, and he was praying you know, for the praise of men. And somewhere in the back, and if you were a tax collector, you had to be in the back, and you had to be away from people because you were hated and scorned, is a tax collector. And notice his posture. It says the tax collector stood at a distance, looked down, beat his chest, which is a sign of anguish, and cried for God's mercy. Just as an aside, let me encourage you. There, to, to when you pray, there, there's no right or wrong posture really for praying because you see all kinds of postures in Scripture. But sometimes you need to just be on your knees. You just need to be bowed before God because there is something about that physical posture that is an acknowledgement of His position. You come to God humbling yourself. Now, keep this spot here in this chapter. Turn real quickly over to Psalm 50, because I want to show you something here. The 50th Psalm. Now, in Psalm 50, there's I'm going to kind of set it up for you, and we're going to begin reading in verse 7. But there's a court trial going on. And... uh, Israel is the defendant, God is the prosecutor, and God is the judge. So you can kind of tell how this trial is going to end, right? And and so beginning in verse 7, God says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices, and your burnt offerings are continually before me. I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all it contains. Shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of male goats? Offer to God a 
Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Now, let me explain to you what just happened there. It, it was a common practice or belief among the pagan religions of the day that when they sacrificed to their gods, that their gods literally ate the flesh of the bulls and drank the blood of, of the, the animals that were sacrificed. There, there was like this uh, codependent relationship that would go on. And you see that even in the mythology of Greek gods, where the idea is that you, um, you, you know, they need praise or worship from men to exist. So when men aren't worshiping them, they send calamity on the earth to force the men back to worship, and they depend upon each other. And, and so that's what the pagan religions did. They believed their gods literally needed these sacrifices to survive. And what had happened was that mindset had begun to filter into God's people. And so what God says to them, he says, look, I, I don't have a problem with your sacrifices. He said, that's fine. But I love what he says. I think it's in verse 12 there. Yeah, he, he says, if I were hungry, now there's a clear implication there, I'm not. But if I were hungry, would I ask you? He said, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Every beast of the field is mine. He said, do I eat the flesh of bulls or, or drink the blood of male goats? He, he says, why are you coming to me as though I need this? And I love what he says there in verse 14. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. So in other words, what God says is, don't come to me as though you have something I need. What does thanksgiving acknowledge? What someone else has done for you. And so God, in essence, tells them, don't come to me as though you have something I need. You come to me acknowledging that everything comes from me. In fact, look at the blank there. If you turn back and look at your booklet. Never come to God as if you have something he needs. That's part of humility. It's coming to God knowing that every good and perfect gift comes from him. Kendall and I were talking about this today. One of the things that keeps me humble is the realization that I do not have the power, no matter how eloquent or how funny or whatever I could be, to change a heart. Only the Spirit of God can do that. And so that keeps me humbled coming to him. Because I acknowledge that everything comes from him. So you don't come to God as though... You've got something he needs. So humility, turn the page, page 11, and look in verse 15. Simplicity, simplicity. Verse 15, it says, And they were bringing even their babies to him, so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they, be, he, they began rebuking them. By the way, what's Jesus doing here? He's praying over these children. You know, Jesus isn't poking babies, you know, just to touch them. He's putting hands on and blessing and praying over these children. And so these parents were bringing their children, and Jesus was praying, and the disciples rebuked them. And, and verse 16, but Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, Whoever, and this is the key, does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. So we come with simplicity. Now, let me real quickly say something. There is a difference between childlikeness and childishness. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of childishness in the church today, people who get their feelings hurt over anything. But the idea is coming as a child comes. And let's talk about that. Look at the blanks there, different ways a child comes. The first one is a child comes trusting. Trust. I mean, you, you basically, with a small child, have to earn their distrust. That's why they'll jump off of high things, believing you'll catch them, you know. 
Years ago, we, we went on a um, retreat. I was teaching a retreat for a group of college students. And then one night, they decided to do a trust fall. How many of you know what that is? The terrible thing. And <laughs> what they were doing was these kids were standing up on a six-foot wall. And then down below were all these other kids, alternated guy, girl, and they were locked hands across like this. And they would fall backwards off and catch each other. You know, I trust that you'll catch me. So at some point, they turned and looked at me. They said, okay, Mark, it's your turn. I said, no. They said, oh, come on, it's your turn. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. They said, what's wrong? Don't you trust us? I said, look, I trust you want to catch me. But this body at 19 pounds per square inch coming off that wall, I don't think you can. They said, oh, you don't trust us. I said, look, I believe you want to. I don't just think you can. Listen, when we are trusting God, we're trusting two things. Number one, we are trusting his heart for us. And number two, we are trusting his ability for us. Do you know, by the way, when Jesus talks about looking at the sparrows and how God provides for his children... He doesn't appeal to the fact that the Father has the power to do it. He appeals to the fact that the Father's heart is to do it. He wants to care for you. And so we come to God trusting Him that that even in the hardest issues, everything is flowing through His love. And He's got a greater purpose than we see. Secondly, we come dependent. Dependent on God. Again, acknowledging, listen, let me just tell you a simple truth, and I guess it kind of brings this whole issue down. You can't even want God without God. (laughs) Everything comes from Him. So we come to God utterly dependent. I tell you, nothing has kept me as dependent upon God as the calls that God puts upon my life as a husband and a father. And, And not having a dad there to show what it was to look like and having an alcoholic mother, you know, I just, I, I, I just, you know, I'm de- desperate. God, I don't know how to be a good husband. I don't know how to be a good father. And it just keeps me crying out to him. But that's a good place to be. Thirdly, ambitionless. We talked about ambitions. Now, I should really qualify that, not with no, well, although a child, yeah, childs usually have ambitions when they, They're trying to get things out of you, but really without selfish ambition. One of my favorite heroes of the faith, and and many of you know who she is, was Corey Ten Boom. And um, I remember his pastor telling me this story. He said that in in the early 1970s, at the end of the Vietnam War, there was a rush of refugees who came over from Vietnam, and uh, they were trying to resettle them here in the States. They were fleeing the fall of Saigon, and And so a large group of them landed in Arkansas, and they were at a campground there. And this pastor had brought his church up to this campground uh, to to just help out any way they could. And so he was talking to the man who was in charge of it, and they were coordinating. And he said, while they were talking, this little old lady kind of shuffled up, and she said, what can I do to help? And he said, well, here, he said, you know, the, this man running the campground said, gave her some sugar candy, some hard candies. He said, go pass these out just to get energy in them and, and to help them. So she shuffled away, and, and, and the pastor kept looking at her, and he said, who was that? And the guy said, that's Corey Ten Boom. Now listen to this. She was over 70 years old. He said she hitchhiked from California to be here so she could help. And I tell you something, that, that, that story, I've never forgotten that. This was a woman who had a major motion picture made about her life, a best-selling book about her life. And she's hitchhiking from California just to help any way she can. And then teachable, a child comes teachable. I, I had a man years ago who made this simple statement. He said, the moment you lose your teachability is the moment you stop growing spiritually. Because what you will find is the people that God uses to teach you sometimes don't look like you think they would. Sometimes they're children. And and so you have to have a teachable heart. God, I want to learn every lesson you want me to learn. Well, let's look at the next one. Look at verse 18. 
It says, a ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. Now, by the way, I've heard preachers say, well, the arrogance of this young man, to say he had kept the whole law, he was proud and he was arrogant. Well, yes, he was, but not on that, that point, because remember, Paul said, according to the law, legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. He said, I followed all the rules. And that's what this young man is saying. I've done what I'm supposed to do, what they've told me, the religious leaders have told me I'm supposed to do. And so verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And you see the key there. He said, Sell all your possessions, distribute to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. So you, you come surrendering. Now, look at this next blank here, because this is important. Surrender is never a loss. It always gains something greater. Let me tell you, particularly for you younger folks, the biggest lie Satan will ever feed you is the cost of yielding to God is too great. If you surrender to God, it'll cost you too much. Can I tell you, I have never met a person in my life who regretted yielding to God. But I have met more than I can count that, as Proverbs says, at the end of their life, they groaned in the midst of the assembly for a wasted life. So it always gains something greater. So here, here's some questions. Have you surrendered, number one, your plans? Have you surrendered your plans? You know, we, we have that tendency to, again, and, and I know Kendall referred to this as a church, you want to find out what God wants to do. We have these, this tendency to make plans. And you know, in particularly in a Baptist church, a need comes up, something's in front of us. What's the first thing you do? You form a committee, Right? And everybody gets in there and you get people who know something about the subject and everybody talks about it. And then you come up with a plan. And after you've made the plan, then you go to God and say, God, God would you bless this plan? Instead of saying, God, what is your plan? Because you know what you find in Scripture? God rarely ever, if ever, does anything the same way twice. I, I remember going years ago into a meeting in Life Action where we were going to discuss, at that time, we were in financial stress as a ministry, and we went together as men to talk about this and pray about this. And I loved it because the first thing we did was we went to prayer. We ended up coming out of the room and sending financial gifts to pastors all across the country. I love that kind of thinking. Because God never does things the way we think He would. Have you surrendered your plans? Have you surrendered your desires? Your desires. So God, it's not wrong to have certain desires, but to yield them, to put them under the authority of Christ. Now, this is a big one. Have you surrendered your possessions? Your possessions. Yeah, that, for some people, that's more difficult than others. You know, it, it's funny along the way. I, I'm not a things guy. I, I just, I grew up without a lot. And so I've, I've never, possessions have never been big. It's not, you know, I'm human. And so, Everybody deals with greed on some level. But over the years, it's funny what really strikes me. I remember years ago when we were on the campground, in Life Action Campground in Michigan in the summer, three of us families went together and each bought a golf cart. And they were old Yamaha golf carts. And, you know, uh, we, through the summer, we would ride around on the campground. My girls learned basically to kind of drive, driving these golf carts. I would drive out onto the hill there on the property and pray a lot and I just, I love that golf cart. I mean, and I can, we would look like the Beverly Hillbillies driving through the campground with all these little kids hanging off this golf cart, you know. And uh, one day that golf cart broke down. 
And I, I took, it, took it in for the guy to look at it, and he said the motherboard, whatever that is, is out. And basically, it was going to cost twice as much as I paid for the golf cart to repair it. And I thought there's just, I can't afford that to begin with, but there's no way we're doing that. So there was a day that I pushed that golf cart. There, were, there was a dump area on the campground, and I pushed it down there to the dump, and I told the other two families, if you need anything off it, the batteries, the wheels, just feel free to take it. But I pushed that thing down there, and, and I remember just, I was so disappointed and I was like, really, God, you had to take the golf cart? <laughs> you know, it's like we don't have a house. It's not like we're living in a trailer. And you take the golf cart? And, and I don't know why, it just really ate at me, you know. And I remember I pushed that thing down there, and I just looked at it. And literally out loud, I just said, God, this is so disappointing. And, and I, I mean, I felt like I was shooting old yeller or something. I just... And, and I just turned, and, and, and here's what happened, though. As I was walking back up to the trailer, several months earlier, uh, we'd had a group come through our church. In, in, at that time, we were in Oklahoma on, a, on our breaks. And they were with an organization that did ministry in India. And uh, it turned out that the guy who headed this organization knew I'd had a young man travel with me, came over from India, traveled with me for a couple of years, and then went back, and, and this young man was heading up an orphanage there, the orphanage he'd grown up in. And I just loved this. I mean, he was just, I just loved him. Our hearts were knit together. And when I found out this guy knew him, I came home after, after the service that night and just said to Amy, I said, you know, we have a chance we might never get again to, to help them. And so we prayed about it, and we gave a very significant financial gift for us, very significant. And I gave it to that guy, and that was a strange thing to hand a wad of cash to a person I'd never met before, the, the night before. And I said, can you deliver this to Jack and his wife? when? Because he was going to be in India in about two weeks at that orphanage. And as I was walking back up to the trailer, the thought hit me, if you hadn't have given that money, you could have got a new golf cart. And then you know, you know it's wrong, but... It's running deep in me right now. You know, like, yeah, God, I could have. But you know what? About a week later, we got a letter in the mail, and it was from Jack. And he was just thanking us for the gift. And he began to, you know, it's, it's just an amazing thing. You know, this many dollars, when he wrote the letter, he said, this many dollars in American translated, and we were able to cash it in for 900 billion rupees. And... And they just started listing that they were able to buy, he was able to buy a motorcycle so that he could get into town to get groceries for the family. He was able to buy a wheelchair for his son who had cerebral palsy. He just went through this list of everything they were able to do with the money. And I just thought, God, forgive me. Now, I can live without a golf cart. But I was able, we were able to bless a family like that. Have you surrendered your loved ones? I'm not going to go deep into that one, but uh, listen, I, I like what somebody said. Nothing you hang on to is ever really safe, and nothing you give, God, give to God is ever really in danger. And so let me encourage you as parents, as grandparents, to give your children over to God. Just say, Lord, you're their protector, you're their provider, you're their director, they're yours. And then finally, your will. Have you yielded your will to God? As Christ did, Lord, it's not that you might not have desires in another direction, but just to say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. And then let's turn the page to page 12. Look at verse 35. It's one of my favorite stories in Scripture. It says, as Jesus was approaching Jericho... A blind man was sitting by the road begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. Now, Jesus here is headed to Jerusalem. It is uh, this his, basically his last trip to Judea 
before he will, uh, at the end of a week, be crucified, you know, go through the trial, be crucified. And as, he's, as he's walking along, this blind man, he, he hears this thing going on, and he, he, hearing the crowd, he says, who is this? And they told him, verse 37, this is that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Now, just so you know, the name Jesus was common for that day. So to specify who he was, he was known as Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus the Nazarene. And evidently, Bartimaeus had heard about this Jesus of Nazareth. He must have heard that he healed the lame and the sick and raised the dead or even healed the blind. Because when he finds out that's who it is, look what he does, verse 38. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He begins to cry out. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. Now, you can translate that this way. They were angrily telling him to shut up. Because you got to remember something. In this day and time, it was commonly believed among the Jews that if you were blind, it was because you had been cursed by God. In fact, we learn this from John chapter 9, that they believed that if you were born blind, it was either because your parents sinned or you had sinned in your mother's womb, and God had cursed you. So in their minds, this may be the Messiah, this may be the long-awaited one, the last person he wants to deal with is a blind beggar who's probably cursed by God anyway. So they're telling Bartimaeus to shut up. But I love his response there. But he kept crying all the more. That's the key there. He just got louder. <laughs> they said, Bartimaeus, shut up. He said, Son of David, have mercy on me. And look what happens. Verse 40. And Jesus stopped. I mean, think about this. Here is Jesus. From the description we have between the Gospels, Jesus could not probably physically even see Bartimaeus. He was off the road. Jesus is surrounded by a large multitude, a large crowd. A commotion arises off to the side. Jesus, surrounded by all these people, undoubtedly having passed other beggars, surrounded by people, listen, every one of whom had needs. Whether they realized it or not, every one of them had needs. But who does Jesus stop for? The blind man who cries out in his need. And we've taught this for many years within Life Action. There is a real sense in yours and my life where daily Jesus is passing by our life. And whether he stops will boil down to whether or not we cry out in our need. Now, I understand he indwells us and he'll never leave us nor forsake us. But listen, the humility that cries out in need gets the attention of the Savior. So Jesus stopped and he commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him and he said, verse 41, What do you want me to do for you? Now that's an interesting question, isn't it? Again, from the description we have, Jesus probably couldn't even see Bartimaeus. He stops, he says, send him to me. The crowd parts, and they shove forward this half-dress, because we know in a, from another version, or from one of the other Gospels, rather, that he cast his cloak away, his coat. So there's this half-dressed blind beggar. He's obviously blind. He's obviously a beggar. He's probably filthy. He probably smells. And they shove him up in front of Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, so what do you want me to do? I mean, don't you think it'd be obvious? You know, when I was growing up, a friend of mine's older brother took a cue ball, a billiards ball, and he put it in his mouth. And when he did, these muscles under here tightened up and he couldn't get it out. They had to take him to the emergency room. He was sitting in the emergency room like this, with a cue ball in his mouth. You know, somehow I doubt anybody walked up to him and said, so what are you in here for? It'd be obvious, right? So here's this blind beggar standing in front of Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, so what do you want me to do? Now, this is key. Look at the next blank there. 
that, that paragraph. It says, notice in verse 41, Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man responded, Lord, I want to regain my sight. This is important to note because desperation is always rooted in specific need. Specific need is what will bring us desperate in our praying. And so this was a desperate man. You know, he didn't say, you know, Jesus, if I could just get a new coat. <laughs> I mean, I threw mine away, and as you can tell, I'm not going to be able to find it. You know, those are the kinds of things we pray for. He said that I might receive my sight. You see, when you're blind, you know what your need is. In fact, interestingly, in John chapter 9, that passage about the man born blind. At the end of that passage, Jesus begins to speak on the issue of spiritual blindness. And the Pharisees who are listening to this get offended. And they say to him, you're not saying that we're blind too, are you? And listen to what Jesus' response was. He said, if you were blind, there would be hope for you. But because you think you see, your sin remains. In other words, Jesus said, if you were blind, there would be hope because at least you would see your need. But because you think you don't have any need, there is no hope for you. And so I love what happens here. Verse 42, and Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Now look at verse 43, because I love this. Immediately, he regained his sight and began follow him. And look at this, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. But look at those last points there. Answered prayer causes us to glorify God to give praise to God. Listen, that's what's important about those impossibles in the back of your book there. Because when God sets you praying, it's so that when He answers, you give Him praise, and when you verbalize what He's done, others then begin to rejoice. And what happens is people say, you know what? If God did that, maybe God could... Fill in the blank. You see, it strengthens the faith of others. And God wants to answer prayer so that when He answers it, He gets the glory He deserves. Do you realize what an incredible privilege that is? That He lets us be a part of that. That He'll set us praying for things. And then when He answers, we give Him glory and then the church gives glory with us. As we testify to what God's done. I was sharing this story with Kendall today at lunch, but years ago we were traveling as a ministry, and uh, we were in a church in Ohio, and it was kind of an odd denomination. It had a Swiss background, and uh, it was just culturally, and then uh, the church culture, they were just very, very reserved, very quiet, proper people. And uh, there was a couple in that church that were in the process of a divorce. And uh, the church was praying for this couple. And they were both coming to the meetings. And she sat on one side and he sat on the other. There was a center aisle. And uh, people would come up to her and say, you know, I'm praying that God would restore your marriage. And she told me later, she said, it made me angry. And I told him, just don't waste your prayers because it's not happening. He's manipulative. He's deceptive. He's going to probably use these meetings to try to get things back together. She said, it's not happening. She said, our marriage is over. They'd even given money to a lawyer to start the process. Well, during those meetings, we came down to the end, and one night we had a night of testimonies. And her husband came forward to share. And he came to the microphone, and he just shared and uh, just was very transparent and open about the sin in his life and the things that God had shown him. And he didn't say anything about her. He didn't say anything about their marriage. He just began to confess his own need and his own sin. It's very broken, very humble testimony. And when he finished, he just kind of walked down the stairs in tears, kind of hanging his head, and he began to walk back to his seat. And as he was walking back, his wife stood to her feet, fought her way out of the pew, 
met him in the center aisle, and the two of them embraced and just began weeping. And, and as they embraced, this, this amazing, amazing thing happened that you could almost physically feel a joy filled that room. I mean, it was it was amazing thing, just the joy of the Lord. And people had been praying for this, and they were watching God answer the prayer. And I remember looking around that room and just tears streaming everywhere and smiles on faces, and there was just so much joy. And it was one of those moments where I just said, okay, God, what do I do here? Because you're obviously taking over this service, and I don't want to trample on it. This is yours. What do I do here? And, you know, I've never done this before, and I've never done it since. But I leaned forward into the microphone, and I said, does anybody feel the need to shout? And let me tell you, it was like somebody took a can of Coke and shook it up and popped it. That place exploded. People just started shouting and shouting and shouting. And then they began whooping, you know, whoop, whoop. Like and listen, these were northerners. They're shouting and whooping. And then let me stop and say something. It was absolutely appropriate because heaven was rejoicing. And then an amazing thing happened. After a period of praise and joy, the conviction of God settled on that room. And with no invitation, people began streaming to the altar. People began going to each other and reconciling relationships. Husbands took their wives down to pray. Fathers and sons began going to each other, reconciling. And and I sat there for probably almost an hour and just watched as God hijacked a service. You see, what happened was God's people prayed. God answered. The church was filled with joy. And a new intimacy was born with God out of it. You see, that's the power of praying. I I think I skipped over these blanks, but let me go back. Unconcerned prayers... Someone has said or unheard prayers. And then I like what somebody said. God doesn't answer prayer. He answers desperate prayer. I mentioned the other night Duncan Campbell and the Hebrides revival. Duncan Campbell told this story. He said that in one of the villages in the Hebrides Islands, there was an older woman who was a deep woman of prayer. Periodically, she would send for him, and she was, he said that she would just give me direction for the day. He said, I didn't know why. He said, but I trusted her. She walked deeply with God, and one day he, uh, she sent for him. She said, Mr. Campbell, I want you to go across the island to this particular village. And Duncan Campbell, this was in the late 1940s, early 1950s, right in there, and he said he, he didn't know anybody in this village. He didn't know anybody over there, but he got on his motorcycle, began to ride across the island. And he said as he was riding along, he passed a young girl sitting on the edge of the road. And as he passed by, he could see that she was crying. And so he pulled off to the side and stopped. And he went back to her and he knelt down in front of her. And he said, can I help you? And in her Scottish brogue, she said, ah, you cannot help me. Only God can help me. Duncan Campbell said he thought to himself, here's a girl the Lord's dealing with her. I'll lead her to Christ. He said, I think I can help you. And she said, ah, you cannot help me. Only God can help me. He said, well, what's wrong? She said, way over the mountain there somewhere lives a man named Duncan Campbell. She had no idea she was talking to him. And she said, God has told me that he's to preach in my village because my brother and my uncle are lost and headed for hell. And Duncan Campbell said, how do you know this? 17-year-old girl. She said, because I spent the whole night in prayer. He said, you spent the whole night in prayer? By the way, it tells you he didn't. (laughs) She said, I am the night before that. He said, you spent two whole nights in prayer. She said, you don't understand. My brother and my uncle are lost. They're without Christ. They're going to die. And God has told me Duncan Campbell will preach in my village and they'll be saved. 
Duncan Campbell said he took her by the shoulders and shook her gently and he said, look at me. She looked up into his face and he said, I'm Duncan Campbell. And he said, I'm not ashamed to say she threw her arms around my neck and began to sob over and over again, you're a covenant-keeping God, you're a covenant-keeping God. That night, Duncan Campbell preached in her village and the first two people down the aisle were her brother and her uncle. You see, I think sometimes we don't even begin to tap in to what God wants to accomplish when he sets his people praying. Let me ask you if you'd bow your heads for just a moment. You know, as we close tonight, this is what I want you to do. Would you just begin praying? And I know some of you have been, and maybe you haven't, but praying for those impossibles, what they are. Maybe if you have some, you can intercede for what they, you know what they are, but just take a moment to say, Lord, would you show me these four or five things you want me praying for? In the next days ahead, in the night, however you want to do it, would you just show me what you want me praying for? In just a moment, I'll close and Kendall will come and close this out. Father, we pray that we'd be a praying people. That we would begin to see you do what only you can do. So Lord, that you might get the glory for it. The glory you deserve. Set us praying, Lord. Set us praying for your heart, the things you want to see accomplished. I pray for every person in this room, Lord, that you would give them these impossibles in these next days. And that they would endure and they would pray and not faint, not lose heart. And then God, as you began to work, as you began to, to answer these prayers, Lord, may your glory be exalted in your people as we rejoice in that. Set us praying, Lord. Answer our prayers. Be glorified. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I don't mind telling you that prayer is a, is a place in my life that I often lose heart uh, because I don't think I'm very good at it. That thought occurs to me frequently. I'm just not very good at this. I feel a little clunky when I pray. I just, God, I'm not real, I'm not real great at this. And uh, man, tonight, the Lord just reminded me that, you know, the, the one that is telling me not to lose heart and to pray is the same one that's saying, I wanna teach you to pray. That my teacher is the one that's, in, that's inviting me. So there's no losing heart because the same one that's inviting me in is not saying, I wish you would do this right. The same one that's inviting me in is saying, let's just begin because I'm gonna teach you. And uh, it just renewed my heart. Just, just sitting here just really renewed my heart in the area of prayer. And I would just say to you, um, you know, if you're in that spot where I'm at, you know, if you're not very good at it, whatever that means, <laughs> um, let's just start. Let's just begin. Let's just start in that place of humility that lets God teach us how to pray. It's what he wants to do. It's what the disciples asked for. It's what he, it's what he wants uh, to do. Um, so wherever you're at, just begin. And I feel like that's the way to learn, right? So um, pick up your kids tonight. Do that also. Uh, and uh, uh, pick up your kids and talk to them about what the Lord's doing in your life. If it's conviction um, that's in your heart, if you need to tell them what I need to tell my kids, it's like, hey, the Lord's teaching me to pray. I want to tell them about that. You should tell them to listen to what they're, what they're learning. Um, come back tomorrow night. Uh, it'll be our final, uh, our final night uh, together in prayer conference at 515. We will, uh, we will eat and then we will get started at six o'clock. If you haven't caught all these, go on YouTube. Uh, you, can do that, uh, you can do that as well. And uh, I pray that you have uh, a wonderful evening um, and a wonderful day tomorrow. And we will see you here uh, again at 515. So you're dismissed. Death is bound. It's broken in the hands of